So I will begin um, with really a discussion on automotive radar. So automotive radar is what's been driving this um, market. Uh, there's been um, automotive radar development started in the 1970s, uh, and then there's been uh, uh, deployments on vehicles, uh, regular consumer vehicles, for more than you know roughly 20 years at this point. Uh, and if you look today, you know the basic uh, at this point advanced driver assistance systems. Um, which are where the uh, radar is assisting the driver, and the driver is controlling the vehicle. You'll see a typical deployment will be anywhere between you know one to five sensors around a vehicle, and the radars here are primarily involved in detection of moving objects, um, and they're usually originally geared for highway driving. Um, a lot of the specs are driven by um, uh, highway driving in Europe, particularly in Germany. Uh, at very high speeds, but the, the radars themselves are primarily detecting moving objects um, and over time have been you know, longer range and wider fields of view. But by looking at moving objects, um, the, this allows them to rely on velocity resolution uh, to be able to separate things out. Uh, and um, there's some positives in this. Late radar, as we'll talk about a little bit, does is able to nicely um, separate out moving objects but um, you're not able to navigate the static environment. And you know, for a regular vehicle, we rely on the driver to do that. Uh, in addition, there's a number of emerging applications in and around vehicles uh, that uh, are getting increasing deployments of radar. Some of these are in cabin sensing, where you are um, using the radar inside the vehicle to detect uh, the presence of a child and prevent uh, hot car deaths. There's also um, exploration on using radars for a door opening or sideways looking applications, as well as some of the replacements of ultrasonic sensors and parking. As we move forward and get into towards uh, level three and level four uh, highly automated vehicles, at this point, the uh, driver no longer is gonna be in control of the vehicle at all times. So the sensor systems not only have to be able to um, detect the uh, moving objects, they must also be able to detect and navigate the static environment. And this is what is driving the next uh, range of performance requirements on uh, sensing systems. Um, and radar in particular uh, is driving towards something that you know, I'm calling imaging radar here, which is a higher angular resolution um, from the radar sensor itself. And you know, this, talk will talk, this talk will give some of the background to overall on radar and some of the challenges as we push it towards a higher angular resolution. There's beyond uh, radar, there's a number of other applications that are also, you know, there's that uh, millimeter wave sensing itself uh, is highly relevant for. So some of these are very, I would say, automotive adjacent. Um, robotics and drones, you're basically trying to use uh, radars to um, navigate the static environment, navigate the environment, just like in a vehicle. Traffic monitoring is very similar to automotive where you're using radars to detect uh, vehicles, except for in this case from a static platform. But then there's uh, a number of other applications, including um, level sensing uh, and factory automation, um, and then uh, building automation where the radars itself is detecting and classifying people uh, within offices um, or around a building. And then you know there's been a whole host of new and emerging applications, including gesture um, and vital sign sensing that people have explored. Uh, so there's a wealth of applications here for millimeter wave sensing. Uh, and uh, it's a rapidly growing area, but there's a, still many challenges remain um, to get richer signals out of a radar. So I'll start with just like an example of what uh, a typical, you know, if you looked, if you cracked open, let's say a corner radar um, today on a vehicle, you know, they would have electronics that are roughly equivalent to this. Um, this is our example at TI, um, but there's, you know, there's a similar sort of complexity maybe with a couple different chips. Um, and from, uh, that are out there as well. So these, uh, the automotive radar today has moved fully into the uh, 76 to 81 gigahertz band. Um, it used to be split between 24 and 77 gigahertz, but now it's um, regulatory changes in Europe and the US have moved it into the 77 gigahertz band. You will typically have um, a multi-channel system. In this case, we're showing three transmitters, uh, four receivers, uh, it uses um, MIMO processing, which I'll get to a little bit later, uh, and a digitally beamformed receiver. So you'll have all the receivers are operating completely in parallel with their own um, down conversion, analog uh, signal chain filtering, and uh, data, converter, data converters. Uh, then it will go through, and you'll go through basic uh, radar signal processing. This is usually done um, 
as a cascade of fast Fourier transforms and then a detection layer, and that can be done on a DSP and ultimately connected over uh, CAN to the host in the car. So this radar system can do most of the driving functions that you, or most of the functions that you'd have for an ADAS sensor. Um, at the end of the day, though, you end up with a total of um, what we're calling 12 virtual antennas. So for this type of sensor, if you have a, an object, let's say at a single range and velocity bin, it's equivalent to a 12 pixel camera. And you can imagine visually, you know, if you were used to using all our megapixel cameras on our cell phones, that you get very limited information and angle from a 12 pixel system. So what does this look like? So this is an example of um, this type of radar in action um, in a parking lot scenario in India. So um, if you look at the bottom right, this is obviously the camera plot. The top right is the radar reflections or detected points um, and then X plotted on a Cartesian XY. So you can see as the car is moving, you can see that you do get a rough outline of the car. Um, the car itself will have about 30 detected points. And uh, you can see, so you can see, you can see the rough outline, you can see the car has some shape. You don't see a lot of details about it, but you can definitely tell that there is something there. The bottom left plot is something that's a little bit more interesting, I think, for people who have not spent a lot of time with the radar. This is the same image plotted in range and Doppler, or radial velocity. And as the car is moving towards this, you can see that you get these very sharp lines. And as it turns, it's sort of you know, well-structured. Um, this is, you can get some well-structured uh, lines here um, from the car. And the car is a rigid body, and that creates a, you know, a relatively um, well-defined structure in the range Doppler plot. So radars will use the range Doppler information and the um, sort of the XY position to understand what's going on. As Sandeep is looking, to, walking towards the radar, take a look again at this bottom left-hand plot. So it'll restart in a second. But unlike a vehicle, when, the, when Sandeep is out here or the person is walking in front of a radar, you will see this has a very different signature. So here the range Doppler plot is showing basically an oscillatory behavior whereas the car was showing these uh, sharp lines. And this is because a human is not a rigid body. And as your average, your torso might be moving at a relatively constant velocity, but your arms and legs are alternatively swinging forward and then swinging backwards with respect to your torso. And the radar can pick that up directly. So you can get a rich amount of information from radar, but still, if you're looking at the plots on the top right, you can clearly see that there's a big difference between what the camera sees uh, and what the radar sees, and it becomes more stark when you're looking at a static environment. I mean, you're not seeing, you know, all the trees, the curves, and everything else. Those are filtered out because you'd have a lot of spurious reflections here. So when we get into, let's say we wanted to completely rely on the radar to uh, handle the static environment, what are the demands here specifically on the angle dimension? So there's a couple of challenging use cases that, um, you know, sort of really defining the emerging requirements for where radar is moving and also motivating some of the solutions we'll talk about today. So the, um, these are both in the vertical dimension that you can have ones in the horizontal dimension. You can imagine one scenario here where you're driving, it's uh, pouring rain outside and there's a motorcyclist. So if you've, there's a motorcyclist and sometimes if you've ever driven and it's um, pouring rain, you'll see the motorcycles will be parked underneath an overpass um, to, for shelter. Now, because it's raining so hard, you can't rely very, you can't rely on other sensor modalities like cameras and LIDAR. Those tend to have uh, sharply degraded visibility in rain, fog, et cetera. Um, radar is the most robust sensor for different environmental conditions. So now you are, you know, you're trying to detect that there is a motorcyclist that stopped underneath an overpass. These are at the same distance and they're both not moving, so they're both static. And you'll need to be able to detect this, so this ends up about a 0 0.6 degrees angular resolution. Um, and then, you know, a more, more, even more challenging scenario is, let's say you're driving on the highway, there's a blown out truck tire um, that's on the roadway, and you have to decide whether to uh, do an emergency braking maneuver or an emergency steering maneuver, which means that you need to be able to detect the safe drive over conditions of a tire uh, at about, um, 80 meters or even further. And this ends up being an angular resolution of about 0.3 degrees. The sensor I just showed has an angular resolution of about 
Um, and and uh, azimuth has an angular resolution of somewhere on the order of about eight or nine degrees. So you know we're talking about at least one order of magnitude uh, improvement on angular resolution, and we need to sustain this both for horizontal dimensions and for vertical dimensions. So this really is moving uh, radar towards um, a lidar-like uh, level of performance, uh, and that's uh, quite a challenge. Um, uh, quite a challenge uh, moving forward. So with that in background, I'm going to start today with a little bit of uh, basics of how uh, radar signals are generated and frequency modulated continuous wave radars in particular. Then go into you know the, the some of the design details of um, the um, circuits that are going into this, um, look at some of the signal processing components and how these are put together to build uh, imaging radar systems, and then talk about some of the future trends uh, that are continuing to challenge us and which uh, require solutions. So to begin with, um, radar is uh, radar uses uh, an electromagnetic wave that is sent from um, the ego vehicle or the radar itself. It goes out into the scene, it bounces off objects, and comes back. And radar basically measures three things that we view as unique, even though that they're, they're somewhat related. The first one is it measures the time of flight of the reflected wave. And if you can measure this time, di time difference, that measure that is directly related to the distance to the uh, target. The second thing that a radar is able to measure is it's able to measure the uh, radial velocity, or the relative velocity between the two. Uh, and this is effectively the Doppler shift. Um, so and if the uh, target is approaching the uh, radar, that means that the reflected wave will come back at a higher frequency. And if the target is moving away from the radar, the reflected wave will come back at a lower frequency. So if you can measure this frequency shift, you're able to, uh, instant, you're able to measure the uh, relative velocity between the two, the uh, radar and the target. And the last thing is that radar uses multiple antennas. Um, to be able to measure the angle. And uh, modern radars offer very nice distance and velocity resolution. So they're very good performance on distance and velocity uh, and very weak angular resolution. So as I said, the example sort of this general state of the art of what a typical radar installation it would be on a vehicle, it's like a 12 pixel camera if you're just looking at angle, which is very, very, very coarse. So, um, the next thing is uh, certainly is we want to figure out how far a radar can see. Um, so I'll just you know walk through um, derivation of something we'll call the radar range equation, which really sort of links up the circuit performance with the final scene performance. So you'll typically have a transmitter, um, which will be delivering, um, let's say, power PT into an antenna. This will um, be multiplied out by the antenna gain, generate a, um, a, a wave that's going out into the scene. It'll set up a, um, a power density of the object after some isotropic spreading. So the, the, this is the power density of the object. Part of that will be reflected by the object. Um, and it'll, the amount of that gets reflected towards the receiver is related to something called the radar cross-section, which we'll get to in a couple slides. Uh, that will spread um, and go through isotropic spreading back towards the receiver. And then the receive power, this is captured by a receive antenna. So the receive power ends up being proportional to the transmit power the antenna gains on the transmit and the receiver, and then inversely proportional to R to the fourth. So for those of you who have looked at, let's say, communication systems or other free, you know, other uh, line of sight communication, you'll typically have a, a 20 dB per decade path loss. Um, radars, because there's isotropic spreading both in the forward and the reverse direction, you end up with 40 dB per decade of path loss. So um, far out objects get very small compared to close in objects. And you must be able to handle a, a high dynamic range uh, as you're developing your radar system. Um, ultimately, we want uh, to have, be able to detect objects with a minimum uh, signal to noise ratio. Uh, and so this ends up basically, you can calculate the SNR from the received power and then uh, the uh, noise figure and integration bandwidth. And then ultimately, this will allow us to capture the maximum range. Um, and the key thing here is that because of this, you know, one of the, one fourth power because of the 40 dB per decade. Um, if you're trying to move any individual knob, like the output power, like the antenna gain, you you don't get a lot of bang for your buck. So it's it's relatively challenging to extend the range. Um, current radar systems typically will be you know those low cost radar systems in vehicles. 
will have a maximum range of between about 150 to 300 meters, uh, depending on their field of view. Uh, last thing I'll just mention briefly is that there's this you know, so-called term the, in this uh, radar range equation, we have the term for sigma, um, which is the radar cross-section. So this is a measure of the return to signal power towards the target radar receiver. Its actual units are square meters. Um, so you would, you know, it's basically an area term. Uh, you would think, it, so it's sensitive to many things. It's sensitive to the material. Um, metallic objects reflect better than, let's say, uh, um, wood or uh, plastic objects. It depends on the size uh, and the shape as well as the angle of incidence. So, um, you know, you can roughly see here, these are typical RCSs in an automotive scenario. These can span roughly uh, th uh, three to four orders of magnitude uh, in terms of the RCS from a large truck uh, down to a small child. And when we get to imaging radars, if we're looking more at the static environment, um, there's even worse cases like guardrails or overhead signs that can have radar cross sections that are closer to 1,000 or 10,000 square meters. Um, in the laboratory, uh, we would like to use things that have well-behaved RCS. So, you know, a very common example that we would use is a trihedral corner reflector, and this has a very well-defined RCS um, that's related to the dimensions. But you can also see that the RCS actually varies with the wavelength. So um, you can have, uh, th this is another interesting property, that uh, different objects will behave uh, differently at different frequencies. So, um, you know, you, there's a lot of uh, work studying what the RCS is or controlling the RCS. Um, if you've ever spent any time understanding what a stealth plane is, um, a stealth plane is just a plane that's designed to have a low radar cross-section um, through uh, the material selection and the shape of the plane. And then the last thing that radar, you know, the, the real key characteristics besides range that we're interested in is resolution. So resolution in the radar context is the ability to, for a radar to separate out two objects. And the radar is able to separate objects in any of the unique dimensions that it sees. So it can separate out two objects that are different distances. Uh, and this is just inversely proportional to the bandwidth. So you want to have a wider bandwidth. Uh, to be able to separate out more closely spaced objects. Second thing is that uh, it can separate out two objects that are moving at different speeds. Uh, this is the velocity resolution. And this ends up being uh, the velocity resolution gets uh, improves at higher frequencies where we have smaller wavelengths or longer observation time. And lastly, uh, angular resolution. The angular resolution is dependent uh, on the wavelength, so you get better angular resolution at higher frequencies, and is also dependent on the aperture size. So if you have a larger antenna system, um, you'll also get better angular resolution. Um, and as over time, we see that uh, these radars are at 77 gigahertz, and moving to higher frequencies will tend to improve all three uh, resolution dimensions. And that's why you know, that's really driven, you know, the, the, the overall trend moving into uh, the upper portions of the milliliter spectrum. Now, because of the fact that the uh, range resolution is dependent upon the bandwidth, the radar is, can't just send out a very simple sine wave. It has to do something more to generate a non-zero bandwidth signal. So there's a lot of different modulations out there, and I'm not going to go through these because it's beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but there's many, many different modulations that are used, um, and this is sort of what is, what is being done to shape the waveform. Um, the actual, there, the, there's uh, time domain modulations, which is sending out a simple pulse, um, OFDM, which is used in communication systems, and then a variety of modulations on a uh, continuous wave or you know, continuous wave signal. Um, there's many interesting trade-offs here. Ultimately, I'm, I won't go through these, just mention that, at least for the scope of today's talk, um, the dominant technology today in millimeter wave radar is a fast trip FMTW system, and that's what I'll be focusing um, the, the rest of this talk on. All right. So what is an FMTW radar? So in an FMTW radar, the transmitter is sending out a constant is it sending out a frequency that is ramped over time, and in these fast trip FMCW radars, this ramp is repeated into a sawtooth pattern. 
So the, the transmitter is a constant uh, envelope, and it's just the frequency that is ramped uh, linearly over time. This goes out into the scene. It gets reflected off objects and comes back. Uh, and you can see two things on the received waveform. The first one is that there's a horizontal uh, shift. This is due to the time of flight. And the second one is that there's a vertical shift, and this is due to the Doppler frequency. In the receiver, the transmitter, the transmit uh, waveform is mixed with the receive waveform. And as you can see, there's a constant over the, over the overlap portion of the chirps, there is a constant frequency difference between these two. And this means that for a single radar reflection, you will, after you mix these two together, you'll get a constant frequency at baseband. And here, the range is proportional to the interme intermediate frequency. Uh, this pattern is repeated many times. The sawtooth uh, pattern or this ramp pattern is repeated many times. Uh, and if you look at the phase of an individual range, uh, phase of an individual target, that phase will rotate from chirp to chirp depending on the radial velocity. So um, the radar is able to, um, the radar signal processing will do an, an FFT within a chirp to be able to determine the range. And then it does a second dimensional FFT across chirps, which allows it to um, estimate the velocity. So the key components here that we have to have in a radar system, we have to be able to generate uh, these ramps. We have to be able to emit them and control them. Then we have to be able to receive and process them um, mix in the receiver, mixing the transmit ramp and the receive ramp. And those are the basic uh, analog components that we have to, to, to develop. The, the last thing um, in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, single processing or the, in terms of the construction is how do we determine the uh, angle of arrival? So the this is the, this is using the uh, concept of a phased array system, um, phased array beam or and digital beam forming for us. So the way that the angle is determined is you would use multiple antennas. In this case, I'm showing this as only receive antennas. But you would use multiple antennas. These are all receiving the same the, the same wavefront. And as you have a wavefront coming in, so you can imagine that the receive waveform is coming in as a plane wave. The this plane wave will hit, since it's coming in from the right, it'll hit channel four slightly before channel three, slightly before channel two, etc. This will generate a small time difference between the received signals in, in, in all these channels. And that time difference is actually gets translated into a phase difference between the multiple receivers. So if you can estimate this phase difference, you can therefore estimate the angle of arrival. And ultimately, you know, working through this, the uh, angular resolution is, as I showed earlier, uh, ends up being um, inversely proportional to the aperture size. Now, what we're actually measuring is we're measuring the phase difference between multiple channels. Phase is periodic, uh, has a period of 2 pi. So you really can't unambiguously determine a phase shift that is more than plus or minus pi. And this ends up meaning that if you want to be able to determine all angles, let's say between plus and minus 90 degrees, so in a hemisphere, then your antennas must be spaced at half of a wavelength. And if we work this out, this means that the angular resolution with this constraint, the angular resolution is no longer dependent upon the wavelength or the aperture size. It ends up being just inversely proportional to the number of antennas. So if you want to get better angle resolution and you want to be able to you know, sample the entire uh, plus minus 90 degrees on a biggest field of view, uh, you need to create larger numbers of antennas. And uh, from a cost perspective, this is very challenging because antennas are the most expensive. You have a lot of electronics built behind all these. So um, as I showed in a single chip, um, the sort of the, 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 the typical chips that are used today uh, at millimeter of radar have roughly four receivers and three transmitters, so seven physical antennas. Uh, and there are practical limits in terms of the number of channels that you'd want to put into a single semiconductor. Uh, one is um, it increases the packaging complexity if you add more channels. 
It will uh, increase the fan out and routing loss between the chip and the antenna. There's a lot more heat. Um, so today, there's examples ranging from roughly six to 40 channels integrated onto a single die. Um, but ultimately, in order to get sufficient angular resolution, we need to move that. We need to have hundreds or thousands of effective channels. So um, the solution that the solution that uh, is seems is uh, is common here is not only do we need to be able to create one mimic or one chip that can generate and receive waveforms, radio waveforms, we want to be able to have multiple of them that can act to create a coherent radar um, and be able to therefore extend a basic radar functionality into a cascaded system that's useful for imaging. So now I'm gonna actually talk about how do we build with these radar chips or how to, what, is, what are the circuits that are enabling um, these radar chips to operate coherently over a larger array and deliver the imaging level of performance that's required. So with that, I was said, uh, you know, the, the three things that we need to be able to do, we need to be able to generate um, a uh, linear ramp and distribute that across multiple chips. Then we have to be able to transmit it effectively and then be able to receive it. So we're gonna start with actually, what does it take to generate this linear ramp? So uh, a simple way of doing this is we would start with a voltage controlled oscillator. Uh, and this is shown here as a simple uh, NMOS uh, cross-coupled uh, VCO, where you have an LC tank, uh, inductor and capacitors. And then uh, this, this tank would naturally resonate at one over root LC, but it's lossy. Um, a cross-coupled NMOS pair will uh, create a negative resistance uh, of one, negative one over GM. Uh, this will compensate for the loss in the tank, and this circuit will oscillate. Uh, and then you would usually tune that oscillation by varying uh, the, uh, you'd have a reactor as the uh, capacitor, and you would vary uh, the control voltage, um, which will change the uh, capacitance, and that will allow you to tune the center frequency. So you can uh, use a uh, DAC to drive the control voltage here, and therefore create a frequency ramp. Now, there's a couple you know, challenges with this, um, but you can sort of directly observe that, first of all, the um, relationship between the capacitance and the frequency is nonlinear. And if you ever looked at Bracter, Bracter curves, the Bracter itself has a, not, a further nonlinear relationship between the voltage across it and the capacitance. So this type of system um, will not generate a linear ramp. You will need to do something like a pre-distortion where you will um, be able to pre-distort the control voltage in order to generate a frequency ramp, but this pre-distortion will not hold up over um, process uh, and uh, temperature variations, and therefore there needs to be some sort of background loop to estimate the output frequency and uh, calibrate this. So this is, this is uh, sort of the most direct way, uh, but it still becomes very challenging to robustly make this linear. Uh, any other time that you are de dealing with a system with high nonlinearities and you want to improve it, we typically will then resort to feedback. Um, and so the phase lock loop is the general concept of you know, how to generate clocks using feedback. Um, and in this particular case, if you want a precise output frequency of a clock, we will stabilize a VCO by embedding it in a PLL. So the PLL just basically takes that same voltage controlled oscillator, uh, it takes the output it will uh, divide it down um, using a frequency divider or a counter, and then it'll compare it to uh, a known reference frequency gener generally created from a, a crystal oscillator, and then we'll uh, then close the loop. Uh, and when this is uh, well designed, you will get the output frequency will be uh, an integer multiple of the reference frequency. So this is a very nice way to linearize uh, or stabilize the output of a VCO. Uh, and get a precise outputs, even with all the uh, variabilities of the uh, nonlinear voltage to frequency characteristics. Um, however, when we're trying to generate a smooth linear ramp, the output frequency here is, is forced to be an integer multiple of the reference frequency, and um, you would get very, very large steps. So the next step is um, to extend this from an integer NPLL to a fractional NPLL. So in a fractional NPLL, it's the same structure, but in this case, the divider has, uh, instead of a single uh, fixed divided by N, you can have multiple uh, multi uh, multi-modulus divider, 
where you can, let's say, in this case, have uh, n and n plus 1. And you will toggle between these two. And if you toggle between these two, let's say, fast enough, you will end up with an average division value of n plus alpha, where alpha is a fraction between 0 and 1. And this allows you to uh, have very fine frequency steps, because now you can have, uh, um, by uh, making alpha very precise, or control alpha precisely, you can get uh, arbitrary frequency steps. The problem is when you are doing this dithering, when you're jumping between n and n plus 1, you're injecting a lot of uh, error into the loop. Um, so in this case, uh, fractional MPLs will use a sigma delta modulator. This will um, shape the errors, that the error that's being injected into the loop comes up at higher frequencies. And then this uh, loop filter, which is a low-pass filter, will uh, suppress uh, most of that uh, error term. Now, the challenge here in a fractional NPLL is that um, when you, the uh, loop bandwidth, there's a sharp trade-off between generating linear ramps and uh, the quantization noise. So as I mentioned, the sigma delta modulator will shape the quantization noise to higher frequencies. So you normally want a lower frequency uh, loop filter to be able to filter that out. On the other hand, we're trying to generate fast linear ramps. If you want to be able to generate a fast linear ramp, this loop must respond um, basically faster than the ramp rate. You, to be a linear ramp, you need to get multiple harmonics of this sawtooth waveform through here. Um, and this would require a wide loop bandwidth. So you're basically, uh, with a simple fractional MPLL, you're stuck with the trade-off between quantization noise and uh, fast ramp linearity. So, you know, in the next step here, there's a lot of techniques to solve this, um, but certainly in the technique that what we have done is simply to use a cascaded PLL approach. So this combines both of the previous techniques. So we use an integer NPLL that will generate, instead of a 40 megahertz crystal, it'll generate a, a much higher frequency, in this case, close to a gigahertz uh, reference. Uh, this is an integer NPLL, so it's not modulated, and it um, can uh, be used and generate very low phase noise. Then the actual loop, uh, by increasing the uh, reference frequency, um, you're able to uh, basically, um, you, you, you are pushing out, um, you're increase, effectively increasing the oversampling ratio for this, uh, the sigma delta modulator, and therefore the quantization noise is shaped up to higher frequencies, so you can expand the loop bandwidth and get a better trade-off between um, the quantization noise suppression and the ramp linearity. Uh, the actual VCOs in this case are operating, instead of at 77 gigahertz, they're operating at one-fourth of that, 19.25 gigahertz. Uh, and this is chosen because um, the uh, tank Q, that, the, the Q of that LC tank, is maximized uh, around uh, this frequency in our technology, which is a 45 nanometer our CMOS process. Um, one of the, even with the PLL, the, um, we still need to have a fairly large uh, barrector to be able to have a wide continuous tuning range. Uh, and as you go to higher frequencies, inductor Q will improve, uh, but barrector Q will actually degrade. Uh, and you end up with a, it's a sweet spot that's technology dependent on where you'd want to practice. this. And so for us, we do that about one fourth of the frequency and then uh, multiply that up uh, using a, an RF multiplier to generate the 80 gigahertz waveform. So now um, you have, this is an example of what this looks like. You'll have the, you know, the crystal oscillator um, that's at 40 megahertz, that cleanup PLL, uh, which is an integer NPLL generating the 900 megahertz reference. We have chirps that are uh, generated directly at 19 and a half gigahertz. Uh, and this will get multiplied up on chip and distributed to the multiple receive and transmit channels. But as I said, that works for a single chip. When we want to get to imaging radar, you now have to do this across multiple chips. Um, so this is, um, the, the, the next step is to be able to, sh all the chips must have the same coherent local oscillators. They all must have the exact same uh, chirp waveform. So the distribution um, can be done directly at uh, one-fourth of the R frequency. So rather than distributing 77 gigahertz signals on the board, now you can distribute at lower frequencies where loss is less. So on the primary device, primary die, it will send out um, the 20 gigahertz waveform. And then on the secondary dies, it'll receive the 20 gigahertz waveform from the board and uh, bypass uh, its own synthesizer. Uh, and therefore, now they can all get the same um, same chirped waveform. 
Even on the primary device, however, you don't want to have a length difference um, because the, the, the length difference on this waveform. So we'd like to avoid any systematic mismatches. So even on the primary device, it will accept its own uh, signal out from the board. And you can uh, balance the routing to all the chips um, by, route, by having um, uh, by using this basically this uh, loopback topology on the board on the primary device. Um, skip that for a second. And then the uh, lastly, we not only need to make sure that the uh, ramps are all coherent, but even the data converters also must be sampling uh, at the exact same time. So in this case, there's a, a, a digital signal that is uh, distributed to all the chips. And the digital signal will uh, start the ADC clock synchronously. And um, also, in this particular case, the signal is also looped back even to the primary device. So you're able to have the ADC clocks start synchronously, and you're able to have the local oscillators all be coherent and uh, with no systematic errors across multiple, uh, across multiple chips. And this will uh, make the uh, phase um, the phase of the received waveforms as stable as possible. So it's impo it, we, we can't get it, it's impossible to get it to be uh, completely eliminated. I'll, I'll address that a little bit more later on. Once we have this, the uh, 80 gigahertz low school oscillator, this is the transmitter, very simple transmit, wave, transmit channels um, in an FMCW radar system. Uh, there is a phase shifter uh, and then followed by a PA. Um, the uh, phase shifter itself, this the phase shifter, it can be used either for beamforming um, or for used for a MIMO radar implementation. Um, and, uh, and in this case, um, the phase shifter just uses a, a slow wave branch line hybrid coupler. So this is a microwave structure that will take uh, an input and create two uh, 90 degree separated outputs. Uh, and um, at 80 gigahertz, you can directly implement this using transmission lines. Uh, and, and that's what we do. So we use a, a transmission lines. Um, so there are four 90 degree uh, transmission lines here um, and that are, that are creating um, IQ outputs. These then go into a uh, basically a Gilbert um, uh, multiplier and mix are mixed with the um, weights that are generated close to the weights that are generated by two linear DACs. And the inputs of these DACs are weighted as cosine and sign of the uh, target phase shift. Uh, there's also a binary phase modulation that can happen at high speeds. Um, this is not strictly necessary because you could just actually invert the incoming signals, but we maintain this um, in order to have separate controls of the uh, binary phase, so plus minus 180 degrees from, let's say, a linear uh, a phase step that can go you know, every, every five or six degrees from zero to 360 degrees. Uh, now, the PA is uh, one of the biggest challenges that you have in millimeter wave frequencies is you have very little output power in uh, typical CMOS technologies. Uh, and this is because of the low operating supply voltage and uh, relatively uh, um, low gain uh, per stage. Uh, and you cannot use excessively large devices because the parasitics become prohibitive uh, at, at high frequencies. So rather than using um, one very large stage, uh, most millimeter wave um, power amplifiers will use uh, multiple parallel, parallel paths and then power combine them. So in this case, as an example, they get uh, um, 12 dBm um, output power. Uh, this uses uh, four, the final output is four, um, four parallel stages. And then these are all combined through a transformer based uh, or distributed active transformer. Um, that will combine these and sum them up at the antenna. And so at millimeter wave, um, you would typically, if you want to increase the output power, you have to use some, way, some sort of series or parallel power combining to get a sufficient output power. On the receiver, the receiver looks very similar to a uh, typical um, uh, wireless receiver. Uh, there will be a, a low gain LNA, uh, and then it will go through uh, passive mixers. Uh, and in the baseband, you'll have a sequential gain um, filtering, and then a continuous dime uh, signal to modulator. 
as we observed earlier, the um, the radar responses uh, fall off at longer ranges. They fall off at uh, 40 dB per decade, so one over R to the fourth. And at intermediate frequency, this means that the close-in objects, which show up at lower intermediate frequency, are much larger than the far-out objects. So uh, this uh, intermediate, this IF frequency filter, it will be basically be a bandpass uh, band shape. It will have a high-pass uh, high pass response to be able to uh, suppress the close-in objects and reduce the dynamic range a bit, and then it'll have a low-pass response to uh, avoid aliasing. Um, and then the, this type of receiver, I mean, we use, you can use a, a complex receiver, which we used, or a, a real receiver. Um, but um, this, uh, we've chosen to use a complex receiver here in order to be able to get a little bit more additional information and interference about the interference that could be present in the scene. Um, and have a, a higher resilience to interference, uh, or improve the signal to interference ratio by 3 dB um, with this type of approach. But this ends up this ends up looking as a very similar to a typical uh, wireless receiver. The last thing that I'll just mention is that um, when you look at um, radar versus wireless systems, radar is effectively a full duplex system. So the transmitter and the receiver are on simul simultaneously at almost the exact same RF frequency. So that means that um, the receiver must not only be able to process the weak reflected signals from the channel, but it's also going to have a very large um, leakage signal from the transmitter through the antenna coupling into the receiver input. Uh, and this means that you're typically dealing with very, very low gain in your uh, low noise amplifiers up front. And um, because of that, you'll have higher noise figures in a radar receiver than you would have in a let's say, a comparable 60 gigahertz uh, communication uh, receiver. So um, putting this together, what, is, what does this start to look like at uh, a system level? So this is an example, uh, and this is our internal example. We're just a chip company. Um, there's, so this, this is uh, built for lab and evaluation purposes. But this is an example of what an imaging radar system looks like using some of the techniques that I talked about today. Um, so there's our, there are four chips here. Um, each of the chips uh, has four receivers and three transmitters. And you can see that there's the primary device here. So this is, this is the one, this device has a, the synthesizer that's generating the chirped waveforms. Um, those are distributed at 20 gigahertz on the board. The, there are two uh, Wilkinson power dividers. These are a microwave uh, power divider that will split the power um, going uh, to four different outputs, so driving each of the four chips. Um, you also see that there is an array of antennas. So there are uh, 12 transmit antennas on the bottom here and uh, 16 receive antennas on the top. Uh, and these are all formed using uh, series fed patch antennas on, on the PCB. Um, overall, this is about, you know, th this ends up being, um, gives you uh, 16 receivers and 12 transmitters. Uh, and so it's still a small number of physical channels, but it's uh, much, <laughs> much better than the single chip case in terms of resolution. And, um, the entire system ends up with about a one and a half degrees of azimuth resolution and about 18 degrees of elevation resolution. So azimuth here is going to be across the width of the board, and elevation is uh, estimating the angle across the height of the board. So um, this board primarily operates in something called uh, MIMO mode of operation. So MIMO, um, which stands for multiple input, multiple output, um, which is also a term used uh, in communication systems. Uh, the acronym means this, the acronym is expanded the same way, but the actual sort of the operation and the benefit is different in radar. So a MIMO radar utilizes multiple orthogonal waveforms on the transmitters, and then digital beamforming to achieve a larger array than possible with the physical array. So as when I showed the beamforming example earlier, we were saying that the um, you would estimate the 
incoming angle by looking at the phase progression across, let's say, all the receivers. In a MIMO radar, you, if you can, because now you have orthogonal modulation on the multiple transmitters, if you can estimate the phases from each transmitter to all of the receivers, um, you are able to combine those in a way that the effective, uh, your, the effective um, virtual array that is formed is a convolution of the positions of the transmit and the receiver way, receiver arrays. So in this particular case, instead of uh, four phase shifts from the four receivers, we have a combination of four phase shifts from cha you know, channel one to each of the receivers and channel two to each of the receivers, you end up with eight um, unique phase values. And this can allow you to create a virtual array, which is equivalent to a one transmit, eight receive system. So this doesn't seem like a whole lot of benefit. Effectively, you went from two transmitters and four receivers to one transmitter and eight receivers, so it's a very small benefit. But um, for the when you get to larger numbers of antennas, uh, in this case, um, you know we have 16 receivers and 12 transmitters. This is 28 physical antennas, but it gives you 192 virtual antennas. So you get a large increase in the effective number of antennas. So you can get much better angular resolution for a given amount of complexity. And then there's an additional benefit, which is that the overall aperture size here um, is larger than the apertures of the transmitter of the receiver rays, because this is, effect, this is, you can sort of sum up the apertures of both of them or the lengths of both of them, and this will allow you to get a larger array. So um, this is um, a very effective technology, or my moderators, um, our effective technology to be able to get a larger uh, virtual array, better angular resolution for a given amount of complexity and size. So for our, you know, the, the system that we built, our demonstrator, um, you can see that these are the actual virtual arrays. So this is the convolution of the transmitter and the receiver arrays. So there's 86, 86 virtual antennas that are all um, oriented in azimuth. Uh, and this is a, a dense uh, uniform linear array. Uh, and then on the transmitter side, you sort of see this coarse array configuration that's sort of off in a diagonal. And we can see that physically on the transmits, you have these four offset, diagonally offset transmit antennas. Those are creating these, uh, uh, these additional uh, antenna positions. So we have very uh, coarse uh, elevation resolution, but very fine uh, azimuth resolution here. And What's shown here is you're able to detect um, two corner reflectors in our lab uh, at about one and a half degrees uh, separation, which is close to the, the theoretical target. So, you know, what, what does this look like? Um, this is just an example of uh, this type of radar now looking at not the moving, in, moving scenes, like I was showing in the video earlier, but looking at static scenes. Um, so in this particular case, you can't really see it unless you, you know, very good eyesight here. On the bottom, on the on the left side, there are two cars that are um, separated um, that are at 112 meters, uh, and they're separated by about 1.7 degrees. And you can clearly see those. Um, you can clearly see that uh, in the radar image. In addition, you can also not just, you can now also see a lot of the other features of the environment. For instance, the trees are now showing up. Uh, in the radar environment, you can also see that there's a fence here with large spools of wire next to it, and you can see all of that clearly in the radar image and the the poles also, uh, you know, the pole in the parking lot. Um, another view here is to look at varying dynamic ranges of radar responses and see how they uh, shadow each other. So we have two cars. These will have a very large RCS reflection because they're metallic and large, and a small person in between. Um, but with this, we're able to, you know, very clearly be able to separate all of these um, using only the angle information uh, with this, you know, with this type of imaging system. And then lastly, this is in a moving scenario as the car's driving around, a snapshot, but you're able to detect, um, you're able to measure the outline of curves um, and then can clearly see that there's uh, differences in the ground reflections between, let's say, the grassy area and the roadbed. And that will, can allow you to do a little bit things like uh, distinguish the edge of roads as you're driving.
um, to have a secondary view of uh, where the lanes are. Uh, this is just another example of um, close to an object, uh, a, weak, uh, a weak reflector um, closely separated to a, uh, a stronger reflector, in this case a bike um, next to the door of a car. Uh, and once again, you're going to be able to see a lot of the features uh, even if the scene is not moving. All right. So going to be, let me give you a second. All right, hopefully this is a video. So this is um, the same scene, but now with uh, people and uh, moving cars. And here you can also see, even though there's very coarse uh, 3D resolution, um, once the once the uh, people are moving, um, you have uh, sufficient uh, 3D angle information that you can estimate the, uh, the the elevation information of the detected points, and you're able to create um, a 3D uh, tracked object. Um, from the movie, 3D uh, information from the moving objects and overlay that over the uh, 2D static environment uh, and be able to get a much richer amount of information uh, with this class of radar system than you would from the uh, traditional radar. Now, the key here when we're doing uh, a MIMO radar is that you must uh, rely, you must be able to generate orthogonal waveforms on the multiple different transmitters. So the simplest way to do this is you would uh, transmit, um, you, let's say in this case with three transmitters, you would transmit on channel one first, then the next chirp you would transmit on channel two, and the next chirp you would transmit on channel three. Very simple implementation. All you need to be able to do is turn on and turn off channels, which you would have that capability anyway. Um, the challenge here is that each channel is observing the scene um, less frequently, or each transmitter is, is uh, observing the scene less frequently. And this causes a challenge because the when we're looking at moving objects, the moving objects uh, are the, the motion is detected by looking at the phase shift from chirp to chirp. So now if a transmitter is observing the scene, let's say one third as often, the, the maximum speed is also reduced by one third because once again, you cannot, we don't want to have the uh, phase progress by more than plus or minus pi between uh, successive chirps uh, because that will become uh, ambiguous. Um, you, can't, you can't separate out a, you know, a, a three pi and a one pi um, rotation, uh, those would be the same. So uh, this scheme has the you know this advantage that your um, block maximum velocity is reduced. Uh, another way of orthogonal modulation is to uh, have all the transmitters on simultaneously, but apply a code to each transmitter on each chirp. And a simple way of doing this would be like a pseudo random number uh, sequence. Um, so you would uh, basically a PN sequence. And um, you could apply that to the transmitters. Uh, here, all the transmitters are on simultaneously. Uh, this means that you're actually putting more energy into the scene, so your SNR is higher. And in addition, in this case, there's no, um, there, since the, the transmitters are observing the scene on every chirp, so you don't have this uh, maximum unambiguous velocity penalty. The problem is, is when you have, like, let's say, a, a PN sequence, the cross correlation and the, and the receivers, what you're going to do is you're going to correlate to the known uh, transmit codes, but there will also be a leakage from the other transmit signals. And if you have uh, the uh, cross correlation here is going to be um, inversely proportional to the uh, number of chirps. So if you have, let's say, if you're sending in 256 of these uh, ramps, you would only be able to separate out, you know, the, the other transmitters will be roughly 24 dB below um, the transmitter that you're looking for, which does not give you very much dynamic range. Um, there's other codes that can be used. Um, this example, this is a Hadamard code uh, that you would be able to have a, a, something that gives you um, very good cross-correlation properties. But it turns out that a Hadamard coded MIMO has the same, uh, it works out that, um, it has the same 
reduction in maximum unambiguous velocity as the time division uh, multiplexing. Um, and you can sort of visualize this as this uh, Hadamard code of MIMO is just a linear superposition of uh, a TDMA sequence. So um, this gives you the advantage that you have multiple translators on and better SNR, but um, does not improve the maximum um, unambiguous velocity. Uh, the latest, uh, at this point, um, another way of uh, modulating the transmitters is rather than, is another coded sequence, in this case, uh, something called Doppler division multiple axis, where rather than random phases of the transmitters from chirp to chirp, each transmitter, its phase is progressing linearly from chirp to chirp, but the rate is changing from transmit to transmitter. So for instance, uh, transmit channel one might be only sending out, you know, it might be uh, um, all zeros. So it's gonna be a zero phase on every chirp. Transmit two will have a, a small phase progression, maybe 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees. And then channel three would have a phase progression that's twice as fast. So the first chirp would be at 20 degrees, the second chirp would be at 40 degrees and so forth. So this is a well-structured code what actually ends up happening is that you are effectively uh, applying the applying a um, a phase sequence that is emulating what would happen if they, uh, an object was moving. And so, when we do the range Doppler processing, this um, DDMA scheme causes the received waveforms to from different transmitters to show up as if they were coming at different velocities. So it splits up the velocity space, and each transmit waveform will then be showing up at a unique, um, unique uh, velocity offset. Uh, and this allows you to use standard rate or signal processing, and then be able to, est you know, estimate the um, or be able to um, separate out the the transmit waveforms after the 2D FFT output. Um, so it's a very low complexity way to do this. Now, once again, you are actually splitting up your um, overall uh, velocity into many different bins now based on the number of transmitters. However, this is done in a way that allows you to easily disambiguate. So you can, you, you can figure out um, which is the, uh, what is the actual true velocity and recover back to the original Vmax. Um, so this, this scheme uh, ends up being a very, uh, very attractive and sort of it's and now become probably the dominant or emerging as the dominant scheme for uh, MIMO uh, signal generation. The one thing that's required here is now you must have a linear phase shifter on each of the transmitters and uh, or a multi-bit phase shifter. And that's what I showed earlier with the Gilbert, multi Gilbert multiplier in our implementation. Uh, and just as an example of what this looks like, uh, we have, um, this is a comparison of the time division and the Doppler division multiple axis. Uh, and the biggest thing here is uh, in the uh, DDMA scheme, all the transmitters are on simultaneously. And because of this, you get a uh, larger signal to noise ratio um, because, the, uh, because of the fact that you're emitting more power into the scene at any one point in time. So the average SNR is higher. Um, we can also see that on this plot, this is an example of um, is a person standing at 60 meters. This is a weak reflector in the scene. In TDMA with the lower SNR, there's, you can't even detect a person, but it will it is visible um, when you're using a DDMA modulation where you have uh, all the transmitters on simultaneously. The last thing on the uh, this uh, imaging radar, you know, the, the this imaging radar prototype is while I showed earlier that the, the um, design techniques where you're basically you're creating a local oscillator waveform and you're distributing it to multiple chips, there's no intense, there's no systematic mismatch in this. Um, so all, all the chips, all the channels should have exactly the same, uh, you know, be fully phase aligned. In reality, that's impossible to maintain. So within a chip, there's going to be uh, small mismatches between channels, but that's actually quite small. Um, when you're routing on the board, there's going to be um, delay variations on the board, and those delay variations can vary as a function, vary of temperature or mechanical warpage in the system. When we have multiple chips that are placed together, 
those chips, some of them could be, let's say, um, stronger silicon, some of them could be weaker silicon. So you'll have mismatch between chips, which is much higher than mismatch within a single chip. And this leads to um, errors, uh, errors in the phase uh, between multiple chips. And so, as an example, this is uh, you know this is a simulated example, but um, you know the, of the 86 virtual antennas, you normally would expect that all of them would have uh, for an object um, at normal incidence, you would have expect them to have. Uh, a constant, uh, a uniform phase, as shown here on the right, this is the ideal case, where you'd have a uniform phase across all those channels. In reality, because of all the mismatches, you'll see um, large uh, phase jumps, and these jumps will end up leading to degradation of the angle spectrum. So the ideal case, where there's no phase errors, you get this very nice uh, spectrum and angle, where you have you know one object, in case of zero degrees, and then just standard side lobes um, that are present. When you have all these phase mismatches, you'll see a very complex angle spectrum, including some grading lobes and false objects, as well as very high side lobes. It is not practical to be able to get 15 centimeter an antenna system over 15 centimeters um, that is able to have sufficient phase matching. So it has to match to within about three or four degrees. And it's not practical today to be able to do that from the circuit and the system, uh, physical system implementation. So instead, um, you can start with a design that is as uh, eliminates the systematic mismatches as best as possible, which is what we have done. Um, but still, uh, over temperature variation and aging, there's going to be some drift that will uh, lead to um, mismatch between channels. So uh, the um, solution to this, or a solution to this, is to be able to uh, use a blind calibration, which will, um, this can be done in the, uh, uh, in, in the signal processing components, where you're uh, compensating or, or calibrating and compensating for the mismatch uh, between um, multiple channels, uh, but doing this learning from the scene itself. So in this particular case, um, this is not based off of a fact. There is an initial gain phase calibration at the factory to eliminate any time zero mismatches. But then as you're driving around, you would be able, you would just do normal arranged Doppler processing. You would detect objects and find a suitable range Doppler bin where there's a single bright object. So this is you want one point target uh, in a single range Doppler bin with a high SNR. If you have only one target, it has a well-defined uh, linear phase progression across all the channels. So if we had uh, a target at a single point, it will have, in this case, at zero degree incidence, you'd have a, you know, all the channels should have a, um, a zero phase. And if you see a pattern like what's on the left, you can then estimate what the error terms there are and use that to um, learn that over time. And compensate for these. So this we've implemented uh, a we've implemented a technique like this, and have been able to use it to be able to uh, focus the channels. So shown on the top right, this is um, the image of uh, what it looks like with uh, induced um, induced phase errors of plus minus forty degrees, and you can see basically that the cars and the person are spread out. But after you do blind calibration, you're able to focus uh, the energy more closely, and you can now start to see the outline of the cars with better separation in between that. And the person itself also has um, a more tightly focused um, point. Uh, and the same thing here. So this is another example. Um, with uh, phase mismatch introduced, you get a lot of spreading the poles, which are bright objects in the scene. These get now spread out into these, these poles are very narrow, but they get spread out into a wide arc. And if you can detect using any of the bright targets, whether it's a pole, a close in person, or a car, um, by using those bright targets, you can estimate what the residual phase errors are and correct for that and go from looks like a very blurry image here um, with a lot of side lobes to a, a much cleaner image.
So this type of technique can work with the robust underlying uh, circuit design that you know, introduces minimal or no systematic errors to get an acceptable level of performance um, to, uh, in, in, a, in a practical imaging deployment. Okay, so um, that's where we're at today. And so these, this, this MIMO radar demonstrator, this is sort of now, this, this class of imaging radar is now, um, not ours, ours is a demo, but are going into production and um, for uh, level three vehicles. But wanna talk about some of the future trends. So I mentioned at the beginning that our goal was really, if you wanted to completely um, rely on only a radar for a safe driving scenario in a level three or level four vehicle, you would need to get something closer to 0.6 to 0.3 degrees of angular resolution. And the system that I showed is about, you know, one and a half degrees of angular resolution. So going back to this equation, well, we know that the, uh, the uh, angular resolution is just inversely proportional to the aperture. So you can just plot that very nicely. So if you want a 0.3 degree of angular resolution, that means that you would need to have an aperture that's uh, 70 centimeters on the side, okay? So you build a radar system that's this big, you go to all the um, automotive manufacturers, you say, oh, sure, you wanna put this on the front of your vehicle. And of course they're overjoyed at that because everybody loves <laughs> loves a, um, a large uh, pizza box radar. Um, plus, if you, were do, if you were building this and you actually just wanted to have antennas that were separated by half a wavelength over that entire area, it'd be 120,000 antennas. So as chip people, you know, the opportunity to sell 122,000 antennas, which is thousands of chips per car, sounds great, but we know that's all impractical. So um, this, is, this remains an unsolved challenge of how do you really deploy a 0.3 degree radar system that would enable highly, fully highly automated driving. So, um, you know, the problem is not as stark as I showed in the previous slide. The first thing, we introduced the concept of MIMO radar here. Um, where you can uh, independently estimate the paths from or phases from all the transmitters to all the receivers. The number of virtual elements becomes the uh, product of the number of transmit and number of receiver physical elements. So already you're going from 120 to 120,000 channels, maybe down to hundreds and you know or close to a thousand channels. And the virtual array is larger than the physical array. But even if you were building a 35 centimeter box and put that in the front of a vehicle, that's not uh, acceptable, um, you know, by, that's not compatible with the aesthetics of a standard passenger vehicle. Maybe like a semi, maybe a um, commercial truck, but not a passenger vehicle. So there's a lot of techniques that have looked, a lot of techniques that are out there that have been investigated um, and are all subjects of research at this point. Um, one is uh, using sparsity where you would, instead of having a dense array, you would remove some of the array elements. Um, this uh, can be done, and again, there's a lot of techniques on how to do that uh, appropriately. It reduces the number of channels, but it actually doesn't change the effective aperture size. So if you were building a sparse array, you would, that sparse array with this um, 0.3 degrees, you would still need a box that's, you would still need a virtual aperture that's 35 centimeters uh, or 70 centimeters. So you would still need at least 35 centimeters on a side, which is still too large. There's uh, other techniques that have, can improve aperture. One is uh, some synthetic aperture radar. This relies on the, uh, the movement of a radar uh, and to actually increase the aperture size. So you have your chips are moving and your antennas are moving. And um, if you can record the received waveforms as it moves, you can increase the effective aperture. This is very effective for sideways looking radar, but not for forward looking radar. In a forward looking radar, as the radar moves, you don't get um, better views of the channel. Uh, for those of you who are looking at signal processing classes, um, there's a lot of uh, novel signal processing algorithms, um, music, esperate, iterative, uh, um, adaptive arrays, compressive sensing. These um, are all show some promise. Um, they work and it can improve the resolution at high signal to noise ratios. 
but they all have drawbacks and corner cases where they tend to be unstable, and they're also pretty computationally intensive. So I think that there's a lot of research here. Once again, no one single technique that seems to be um, robust and widely adopted. Um, the other area that you could potentially improve on uh, if you want to get to higher angular resolution, but you don't want to go to a very large aperture, is rather than adjusting the uh, denominator of the equation, we can adjust the numerator of this equation um, by going to higher frequency. Um, you can observe that there are uh, atmospheric uh, windows with low atmospheric attenuation at 140 gigahertz and at 240 gigahertz. Uh, and this would allow you to have a, a much smaller uh, radar size. Uh, however, semiconductors are already somewhat challenged at 77 gigahertz, and especially in CMOS, but not in silicon germanium, um, the uh, F max of the process, the maximum speed of the process, is no longer advancing very quickly. And it's sort of uh, stabilized between 300 and 400 gigahertz. And in fact, in more advanced CMOS processes, it's actually going backwards. Um, that's not the case for silicon germanium technology. Silicon Sigi seems to have, you know, upwards of 500 gigahertz and beyond, um, but it's less compatible to high levels of integration. So there's a lot of challenges here. So you would need advances on the circuit side as well as advances on packaging and fan out to the antennas if you want to be able to extend up to higher frequencies. But certainly this is an open area of exploration uh, and maybe a potential solution. Uh, finally, I'll just mention a couple other uh, trend areas that we're seeing um, in this area. One is um, from the imaging class of radars, obviously there's that's about getting to larger areas, but when we look at the other deployments around a vehicle uh, or in industrial applications, there's a lot of focus on um, shrinking the radar. So one thing as a semiconductor company that we can do is to uh, integrate more and more of the functionality within the semiconductor itself um, and so this is um, you know, showing an example where we have uh, taken the same chip I showed earlier in the very start of the talk and integrate it with antennas on package so that you can uh, miniaturize the entire solution uh, and still have um, uh, miniaturize the entire solution and have everything basically reduced to a single chip. And you can see this is a MIMO radar configuration with the three transmit antennas in this L shape here and the four received antennas in a square on the bottom right. Uh, in this case, uh, this uses a standard semiconductor uh, packaging techniques. So it uses uh, a multi-layer um, uh, laminate substrate. Uh, this is a standard IC substrate. Uh, the device is, uh, the, the CMOS die is soldered on the bottom side. The antennas are formed just using the regular packaging layers. So they're patch antennas that are on the top side of the package. This is an E-shaped patch that's probe fed. Uh, and then the uh, lower levels of the package are used for the fan out routing of the rest of the uh, power um, uh, power and uh, digital signals um, through the balls on the bottom side. This is an undermount configuration. Uh, and then in this type of configuration as well, the antennas are fairly closely spaced, but you can use the multiple package layers and create electromagnetic band gap um, structures within the package layers themselves, which will uh, suppress the propagation of waves on the on the package surf, uh, within the package substrate, and can be used to uh, improve transmit to receive isolation as well as uh, antenna radiation pattern uniformity. So this is the type. Of, this technique works well for very small antenna systems, but does not yet scale to large antenna systems. Um, just given the the the, the uh, abilities to build larger and larger packages and, and uh, very rapidly increasing cost for those. And then finally, I think the last area that's really become, is gonna become increasingly relevant uh, as radars are more widely deployed is uh, coexistence. So as I said, I mean, radars have been uh, deployed in vehicles for about 20 years now, but you know, the penetrations are, they started out in just, you know, really the highest end vehicles with maybe one radar sensor on them. So the likelihood of seeing other radars on the road is very low. Now we're seeing, um, at least in um, Western countries, you know, many or most new cars will have radars deployed. And uh, hopefully from my side, many of these radars on a vehicle. Um, so the number of radars per vehicle will rapidly you know, go beyond one that are on the road. So you're gonna be, if you're driving around, you'll be frequently seeing other radar systems. 
And unlike in communication, where everything is standardized and they're all agreeing to operate the same way, uh, in radar, in uh, radar, this is pretty much you can develop it on your own, and, and most of these have been developed independently. Um, so the radar systems by themselves do not synchronize and try to um, share the spectrum access. So there's been a lot of efforts, um, and mostly in Europe, Mosarum, and um, in the about 10 years ago, and now more recently, a, a group called Amico that has been looking at ways to promote um, coexistence between radars, but these are still in their infancy. So uh, the you know th this will become an increasing problem moving forward. Just showing an example here of two FMCW radars interfering with each other. The uh, when the two radar waveforms in this case, the blue is a desired waveform and the green is a, an interferer. The victim waveform you will start you will see in the victim's receiver output, you'll see these time domain spikes as the two uh, radar waveforms get close to each other in frequency. Um, we do an FFT in the range dimension, and if you have a narrow time domain spike, you will have, after an FFT, that will be turned into a, a wide uh, frequency, um, basically, spread. And this leads to elevated noise floors. Um, so this is just one example where this crossing interference pattern would um, lead to an effectively higher noise floor and will cause you to miss uh, weaker targets that are further out. Um, and so this is a major challenge. And so there's a lot of techniques to be able to deal with this type of corruption, but um, a lot more work needs to be done if you're really going to try to deploy hundreds of radars that can be simultaneously operating within a relatively dense traffic scenario. So with that, I'd just like to wrap up this talk and then, um, so today, um, millimeter wave radars have a tremendous promise for being able to detect um, uh, or existing there already detect moving objects very robustly, um, vehicles uh, and pedestrians and vulnerable road users in the automotive environment, and then um, uh, people and robots in indoor environments. Um, but in order to be able to extend this to um, the next round of performance level that's required, radar systems must go up to much larger numbers of antennas. And this is also following some of the trends we see in other wireless systems like 5G, where the uh, 28 gigahertz 5G deployments are looking at these massive MIMO arrays. So huge, uh, being able to handle systems that have very large number of antennas uh, is required. This has to be done not just at a single IC level, but through cascading in multiple chips. Uh, and then that requires circuit techniques as well as signal processing techniques to be able to fully utilize the information across these chips. Um, all that being said, we set ourselves up to being able to get to maybe half of where we want to get to, so about one degrees of angular resolution. But um, I would say that there's still new advances required and some things that we're working on that are also being done in research to be able to get the, you know, the next run of performance from radar and be able to allow radars to operate, get LiDAR-like performance, and be able to you know, fully handle uh, static scene processing. And then ultimately with this, you know, also see trends on miniaturization and coexistence um, that are continuing to drive, you know, the, the rapid pace of uh, innovation in radars. So with that, I'd like to stop here and then open this up to questions.